So you have another ministry we can monetize? Yes, sir, I do. I was thinking we monetize foreign missions. And how do we do that? Well, you see, for a long time now, most foreign missionaries have been supported by individuals and churches who want them to be free to do ministry in other countries without worrying about their livelihood and whatnot. And that needs to change because... Because it's an outdated model with serious flaws. Like what? Well, first of all, it's definitely not sustainable. If you have thousands of missionaries living by faith to be able to pay their bills and dependent on the generosity of other believers, there's no way that could last very long. And that would limit the number of missionaries. Good point. What else? Well, the missionaries are doing ministry without asking the locals to pay for it. There's so much potential profit being lost every day, it kind of makes me sick to my stomach. They're slaving away at serving people, teaching, preaching, giving away Bibles, and all that kind of thing, and they're doing it for free. Horrible idea. Because people don't value things they don't pay for. You got it, sir. Right on the money. Funny money, punny. I see what you did there. What? The thing that you did there. Forget it. You see, it's a well-known fact that no one has ever been positively affected in any way by something they received for free, especially Christian ministry. So, wow, these missionaries are really stupid for not knowing that. They are, sir, but we are here to save the day. We can show them how to charge people money for all that stuff they're doing. Can you give me an example? Well, let's say you're planting a church. That's a ton of work and you need to be compensated for it, you know? As the good book says, a worker is worthy of his wages, so you need to turn that church into a money-making machine. So, you start charging entry fees and membership fees. I mean, if Netflix charges for membership, why shouldn't churches? It's the only right thing to do in our modern age. And then you charge people a small fee before you share the gospel with them, or before you give them pastoral counsel, etc. And if people start converting, you charge them a larger fee for their baptism. I see, I see. But it's going to be really hard to convince people to make such a radical change in their traditional practice. Actually, it's going to be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yeah. We just... You mean we get naked like the prophet Isaiah? I don't think that'll convince anyone. And I really, really, really don't want to see you naked. Please stop unbuttoning your shirt. Wait for it. But I really, really don't want to see... What is that? Some kind of knockoff Ghostbuster shirt? No, sir, it means no muzzling oxen. Get it? Oh, wow, 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 wow. Wow. Yeah, so like, don't muzzle the ox when it treads out the grain. If we quote that verse, then the scales will immediately fall off of people's eyes and be replaced with dollar signs. Works every time. Amazing! So I guess this means people won't have to support these missionaries anymore. Actually, they're going to take people's support too. That way their income is basically doubled. No sense in having middle income missionaries. I mean, does anyone actually think Jesus and the apostles weren't loaded? He did say the harvest is plentiful. And I've heard that Jesus talked more about money than love and heaven and hell combined. So obviously he must have been filthy rich. Exactly, sir. So what we're going to do to make this an even sweeter deal is start a mission agency that gets missionaries to give us 10% of their income in order to be part of our organization. Oh, I love the sound of that. We get them to raise all the money and we reap the benefits. You, my man, are next level genius. So what do we use all that money for? We'll say it's to cover administrative costs. But we both know it's really just a handy way of hiding the fact that we can't be bothered to raise support to cover those costs, along with <coughs> other things. You said it, sir, but I can't take all the credit for the idea. I read a book recently about pyramid schemes, and it sounded like such a good idea I couldn't resist applying it to my life. But are pyramid schemes biblical? Of course they are, sir. You'll find pyramids all over the Bible, since the Bible's constantly mentioning Egypt, ergo pyramid schemes are biblical. Oh, okay then. That makes sense. You use the Latin word, so I'm convinced. You know, my grandpa was a missionary with Child Evangelism Fellowship in Cuba back in the day. And it just kills me to think of all the kids he did evangelistic puppet shows for and taught songs to for free. Just imagine. 
How much of the lunch money and allowance money he could have gotten out of those kids if he had charged them for sharing the gospel with them? Well, now, you've got to forgive that generation their ignorance since they didn't have the internet bless their hearts. They weren't able to sit at the feet of wise Facebook commentators who tell us that the Bible clearly teaches that Paul had the right to charge people for any ministry whenever he felt like it. I mean, the guy even called himself a peddler of God's word. Thank God for the collective wisdom of Twitter, which has pointed out Paul's important teaching in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, that though Christ was poor, for our sake, he became rich so that we could become rich. That does sound like the Bible. But speaking of the Bible... I've been a little unsettled lately because somebody told me that when the Bible talks about a worker being worthy of his wages, it's talking about wages from God through the free generosity of his people, not wages that he charges people up front for ministry. Well, sir, you just tell those people to go play in traffic. They're false teachers. But why? Because everyone knows that God could never provide enough wages for all the great things that we want to do for him. We have to find other ways to get that money. God's only here to help those who help themselves, as the good book says. But why couldn't God provide enough for the things we want to do for him? I got a t-shirt at camp once that said, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Well, Because. Because what? Listen, sir, I'm going to need you to get all the way off my back about other people's perfectly valid arguments that seem to accord with the very fabric of scripture and undermine everything we stand for. Oh, okay, let me get off of that thing. So what do you think? Should we cash in all the way on this one? Oh, absolutely. It never hurts to try something new like Nadab and Abihu did. Innovation is my middle name. Hey everyone, if that video made you curious, confused, or even offended you, you're not alone. So let me point you to some free resources that will help you dig deeper into these issues. Links down below. First, head on over to the DorianPrinciple.org and read or listen to the book, which is thoroughly biblical in its response to the commercialization of Christianity. Second, check out the website, copy.church, where you'll learn even more about these same issues, but from a different angle. And finally, don't miss Selling Jesus, which complements this channel. There you'll find a whole lot more to read and learn. And hey, if this video upset you, that's okay. But before you leave a comment, please consider thoroughly investigating the deep biblical and historical rationale behind everything on this channel. I think you'll be surprised. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope some of you will consider taking part in abolishing the Jesus trade and freely giving what we have freely received.